Blog Talk Radio.
Yeah, she was all, I was going to say, she was all over the news for uh, being a little kind of spacey on the red carpet with all the interviews. And then, you know, when, of course, the, the interviewer I saw, you know, went digging through her little clutch bag, that was a little uh, much. But, uh, yeah, she just whipped out her little Vapo pen for uh, the world to see, which I thought was a, a bold step forward for, you know, mass legalization everywhere. <laughs> An issue I know you care about. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> Proud yeah, so, I mean, she <laughs> she was smart, she was funny, and, and she was stoned. What more can you ask for to see on television? And she looked great, um, right? She was showing it off. That was, you know, sh- shaking what her mom had or gave her. <laughs> I didn't know she was older than us until last night. I, I would have guessed 10 years younger than us. Uh, blew me away. Wow. I didn't know that until just right now. Yeah, she's 43 and easily one of the most beautiful women on the planet. Anyhow, uh, not to be all Sofia Vergara on a turnstile. Uh, <laughs> minimizing. Uh, yes. <laughs> I would have preferred Sarah Silverman on that. She would have made it funnier. <laughs> oh, amen. Um, let's switch the table then. Let's talk about what the least favorite part of, of that particular show or broadcast or award show would be. Well, uh, I mean, I have to say there were, there were many, many moments that just kind of made me think, uh, what? But I think the biggest, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, and that is Weird Al's horrible, horrible choice to do, like, very, very vapid, simple lyrics to these theme songs, and it was not vocally, uh, I, I can't even, because, you know, I'm such a, I am such a Weird Al fan, and I was so excited when I heard it was going to be on there. And when I finished with that, it was throwing the typewriter at George R. R. Martin, it was it was horrible. Andy Samberg was like a prop. <laughs> yeah, it's it's horrible when you've got Weird Al, uh, who you either love him or you hate him. But to guys like us who have all his records since we were kids, and as a hero, oh. when when he doesn't deliver, it breaks your heart. I want to think that that he didn't write it, that those were Emmy writers. I mean, come on, with Andy Sandler is the funniest part of the gig. Um, or he's just so exhausted from everything he just did to, to put out his most successful record and promote it. I don't know. Uh-huh. But you, I, I think the George R. Martin part was the best part of the skit. <laughs> Why, well, yeah, I guess seeing the look on his face, which was, what, what am I supposed to do now? I am uh, not a performer. I am awkward. <laughs> and, you know, the fact that that was interesting that Andy Samberg was up there because, you know, he and the Lonely Island Boys, they're kind of, you know, the next generation Weird Al. They're the ones that have popular songs, pop songs on the charts that are, are comedy songs, you know, not directly parodies per se, but still, you know, he is the next generation comedy, take, taking the, the comedy vocal mantle into the future. And to have him on there kind of backing him up in this ridiculously stupid number was a little disappointing as well. It was doubly disappointing. Yeah, I can't believe that Al didn't have a better, like, polka medley under his arms than what, what got delivered. But I'm, I'm glad to hear that another I think we new all, Al super can fan. all agree that a polka medley would have been preferred in that <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just glad to hear that another big Weird Al fan was was saddened by the display because I I felt hurt for him after I saw it. So did I. Um, let's talk it was about his Star Wars Christmas great. special, I suppose. After this newfound fame, you know, this was this was it. <laughs> oh, but I love Happy Life Day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. When else do you get B. Arthur with Chewbacca? <laughs> I should have. I should have. Should not have opened Pandora's box. <laughs> now, let's switch gears to uh, to Breaking Bad because they obviously dominated uh, every year, um, and it's their last year. So that means a lot of the great dramas that that we get to see on television right now will have a chance at the big show. Um, 
in the future. Well, and I thought but modern I thought Breaking Bad's dominance. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but it brings up a no, point that I, I've been thinking about all day with this Breaking Bad dominance. Is I don't know if you felt the same thing after they won all these awards. Of course, deservedly so. Amen to them winning everything they deserve. It great television. But all I kept thinking is, didn't the Breaking Bad uh, finale happen forever ago? Why is it being honored now? Did, uh, wh- how is it they are just now getting to honoring something that was almost a year ago? But So I went and looked it up, and of course, the, the, the judging year for, for Emmys is so strange. It goes from mid-year to mid-year. So Breaking Bad, having happened last summer, was at the very beginning of this yearly voting poll, which, I don't know, it's, it's so rare that a show... I guess that's a testament to how amazing this show is. It's, it's so rare that a show a year later is dominating the awards as much as Breaking Bad has been dominated last night. And even prior to the awards, in social media, Breaking Bad is still a thing. People meme it, reference it, joke about it. It's still current. I think it's going to be one of those shows like, I mean, there were ER jokes last night that I think still think hit with 50% of America, Breaking Bad is going to be that. It's one of those legendary programs. Yeah, um, I, I agree 100%. It already is. Uh, I, I'm sure I speak for both of us when I say it is in top five television that I've ever seen. It's it's still mind-blowing, even a year later. Well, I'm glad to hear this Emmy time frame that you mentioned because I didn't know what it was. and I, I really did kind of struggle over the whole Orphan Black snub, um, just because it's amazing programming as well, in, at least in my opinion. I'm a big sci-fi nerd, though. Uh, but that woman portraying upwards of seven, eight characters a, a show, um, yeah, it just seemed weird, but I'm wondering now. I'll be curious to look up what the schedule conflict is there. What about Modern Family? They always dominate. They're not going anywhere. And yeah, they, I mean, I love they show, won. But. This is their fifth. This is their fifth Emmy year winning best comedy in a row. Uh, the only other show to have matched this, as I'm sure you know, is Frasier. Was uh, you know the first, only other show to get the best comedy out right out of the gate its first five years running. So that that I, is a, I, a that's a big big number. Huge number. I, I get it, I guess, because I do enjoy the show. I watch it when I can, but not one of the most revolutionary comedies, in, in my opinion, but maybe that's not what Emmy does. But I just can't help but think, like, Veep is probably the best show, comedy show on television right now. Um, maybe Louie shortly after that. I I just wonder, is this because the this particular Academy only recognizes success plus quality or I mean what's the formula here that that keeps a show like that just winning dominating the award well uh, it's it's funny you ask that it's I, I I've been thinking about this I had this conversation today actually because of the of the shows that were nominated for for best comedy ironically uh modern family is you know of course the whole the whole catch with Modern Family is that it is, uh, they are the most unconventional family, right? This is the, mo- the, the irony of the Modern Family. Such an unconventional family is the new conventional family, but it also parallels the fact that Modern Family is probably the most conventional show of the ones that were nominated. Um, so it, it's kind of funny that way, but uh, quite frankly, I think that's why it has been this juggernaut. I mean, not... Uh, it, it, it is very funny. It is very well written. It's not like it didn't deserve, I guess, the the win. But um, yeah, it, no, it, it is the most conventional. Yeah, it just seems like a formula we've seen before. It's got the Arrested Development style with your typical family sitcom, though. I, I guess because they're gay guys is why it's unconventional. I, I, that's the only thing I see. Or maybe the trophy wife deal. Right. Uh, speaking of which, and, you know. I, and, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say that uh, I, I should say that it was uh, up against Big Bang Theory, which is also a pretty conventional comedy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, also Louis, Orange is the New Black, Silicon Valley, Veep, those are very unconventional 
show. So I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the only one I would endorse out of the bunch, I guess, would be Veep. I just, I, I don't think I've seen writing like that. But back to Modern Family really quick. I noticed Christopher Lloyd was missing, who's a co-creator, one of the main writers, my, my understanding. Um, do you have any TV industry inside knowledge on on where's Christopher Lloyd? Great stuff. Uh, now, you know, this is not the, the – <laughs> I was going to say, this is not the same Christopher Lloyd as uh, – the one that was uh, Doc Brown in the Back to the Future trilogy is a completely different Christopher Lloyd. No. <laughs> in fact, Chris, I thought it Christopher, was Christopher Lloyd Christopher was... Uh, Lloyd. No, no, no. And, and the Christopher Lloyd, actually, I, uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, was uh, one of the main uh, showrunners on Frasier. So uh, his success oh. is continuing, Frasier and Modern Family, both uh, Christopher Lloyd worked on, but not the one that you... Uh, I, I, I thought the same thing. I went and looked it up just to be <laughs> sure that I was right and well, maybe, I was wrong. So just to <laughs> maybe he was there. I was looking for Reverend Jim the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's off dressed so we, up like Doc Brown somewhere, pimping the the whole Back to the Future nostalgia <laughs> thing that's happening these days. <laughs> we kind of joked about Sofia Vergara being on the pedestal, which I still don't understand, and. I know outraged a lot of ladies, but I want to talk about a different lady who I love. Alice and Janney won for Mom, and you're a TV guy. You look at the ratings all the time. Tell me, nobody's ever watched the show Mom, has they? No, no, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was canceled, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I I thought she was going to be nominated for her work on the Masters of Sex or something. I uh, I was blown away. I never sure. even heard of the show, and then I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I googled it, and uh, I see Chris Pratt's wife, Anna Ferris, was the lead, but I didn't see if it was still on or anything. And I believe it was on CBS. I think basically this is this is one of those good examples, uh, and uh, this is just one of my crackpot theories, and that the media landscape covers things that you know the the coasts are watching, things that are hip, things that are media worthy but most of the country is watching CBS, right? <laughs> that's, that's what's going on, is that whatever is playing on CBS, everything in the middle of the country, that's what they're watching. Everything on the coast, they're watching, talking about the HBO, the, the shows, the, the, uh, the AMC shows, the FX shows, these, the, you know, the good television, but the CBS television, the... The, uh, the, the that's the reason why CSI is the or no no not CSI what's the other what's the other initial show on CBS that's the number one NCIS NCIS <laughs> <N-C-I-S. laughs> it's the most watched show in America and of course no one I know watches it <laughs> yeah I, that, that's so true because the two shows that I really like on CBS are I, I like their elementary, their adaptation of the Sherlock mythos. It took me a while to get there, but I'm glad I stuck with it. Um, and then, of course, anyone who knows me knows that I'm a rabid David Letterman fan and I probably haven't missed more than five episodes since I was a child. But um, neither of those do well in the ratings. Um so I kind of touched on Masters of Sex, and maybe that's because what I'm binge-watching right now, uh, it's got Lizzie Kaplan and Sarah Silverman. Of course I am. Ab- Allison Brie is like yes. my dream show. Uh, Amen. But, uh, well, what, are you, what are you and the wife binge-watching right now? I know you guys like to watch a series all the way through. Well, uh, yes, we, we actually just finished uh, binge-watching the second season of Orange is the New Black, which I thought was really good. I thought it was great the way they kind of left focus of Piper and her problems, which were, yes. frankly, the most annoying parts of the show. They kind of let and those Oprah. Oprah relax is so a little good bit. in this season. <laughs> Didn't you agree that Oprah is so good? Sorry. Can See, now... Uh, <laughs> I, I, let me let me let me say very clearly right now. Spoiler alert, because I want to address exactly what she says. But spoiler alert: if you haven't seen Orange Is the New Black season two, I'm about to spoil the way the show ends. But the fact that you called her Oprah is hilarious because you know, of course, the last shot of the show is her getting her ass run over. Which, if she is Oprah, that's very cathartic for a lot of people. 
<laughs> I don't know what it is about that actress who is brilliant, brilliant performance the yes. whole season through. One of the most riveting parts is every time you interact with this woman, but, and I'm sorry, I don't know her name, but for some reason she just reminded me of an evil Oprah and I, I latched onto that. Um, she so was an evil free. Oprah because she was all about the commerce. She was all about the family. You know, I felt like, you know, eventually she was going to walk into some of those ladies' uh, cubes and be like, you get a roll, uh, freshly rolled cigarette. You get a freshly rolled <laughs> cigarette. You get <laughs> We're all smoking. Uh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. So I know you only saw bits and pieces of the, the show because you're a family man and you have a life, um, but... I have to throw out commentary on the Emmys before we close on that topic of the fact that it was horribly weak on, on Seth Meyers part, but more so than that, I mean, they did like a Saturday Night Live interview, the audience piece, it was weak, but all that said, it was mostly a roast of Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> <laughs> and rightly so, for the love of God. That's my question. Is is this just something we need as a country? We need to make fun of Matthew McConaughey. We don't like successful stoners. <laughs> Look, I have no problem with McConaughey, and I've even used the word McConaughey in a sentence once, <laughs> and I'm I, I'm not ashamed to admit that. But let's be honest about Matthew McConaughey. He has one character, be he skinny or robust. He has one character, and it's kind of a dipshit. Sorry, excuse me. A dip. <laughs> uh, he's kind of. Yeah, we we can say anything we want. This isn't on air. I'm sorry. This is podcasting. There is no FCC. I love it. So yeah, he's a fucking same character. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't need to go that far. But you know, he. We we give McConaughey a lot of credit. And uh, did he deserve the Oscar this year? Uh, I don't know. He was good. He was good, but he was McConaughey doing what McConaughey does, just skinnier, just less of them. I guess that's a good thing. Well, I don't know. That, that's how you win awards. You, you play a whore, uh, somebody with a disease. I mean, that's Jim Parsons' secret. I mean, Sheldon on Big Bang Theory basically got uh, Asperger. Um. <laughs> <laughs> basically, hey, they McConaughey. haven't really said that, have they, officially? No, no, I doubt they will. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's how you win awards. I mean, that's an age-old secret. Um, but I could, I, I agree with you. He, he was great, but there were better performances. But uh, and I think that proved true last night as well. I mean, you and I have had this discussion off microphone a hundred times that I personally feel that the long-form storytelling on television is the best writing going on in in TV and movies right now. I think it blows the movies away. That's a good I question. I couldn't agree too. more. Is, is this because the television landscape is so large now, or uh, all these channels need content, so there's a competitive marketplace making television better? I mean, is there a theory behind all this? It's everything you said. It's all of the above. It's the fact that there is uh, a ton of content providers out there that are just scrambling for the best content. And this, uh, you know, also the fact, the, the proliferation of cable and satellite, I mean, it's ubiquitous now. Everyone has it. I mean, it's not that far out. It's in our lifetime for sure. Uh, and a lot of the, even the generation behind us that didn't, you know, some people didn't have cable. Some people still got their television through airwaves and, you know, things uh, of that sort. But I think another big part of it is what's happening in the cinemas and that there is no more storytelling for adults happening in the movie theaters. What you get in the movie theaters are um, the big popcorn movies that are aimed at uh, 12 to now I'd say 29-year-olds at best, but uh, probably more like 12 to 21-year-olds. Uh, so if you want mature storytelling, you go to television. And what's even better is that now that this discovery, so has been made this, you know, the, the staking of the new land, uh, you know, the new frontier. Now that this has happened, the, the, the stories are, are breathing a lot more. They're giving themselves the opportunity to kind of tell the patient's story. Um, 
as, as I may, and not to, di- to digress and not to, you know, uh, pimp out uh, the Stars Network, but uh, it's nice being no able fun. to talk about positively about one of our shows, and that's uh, the Outlander shows, which have started. Uh, and that is a prime example of giving uh, these stories plenty of room to breathe. I mean, our first season of Outlander is going to be uh, 16 episodes over a year. They're going to do eight and then show the next eight in spring. But they're showing the first eight right now. I think we're four episodes in or something, that effect, three episodes. But um, it's, it's the, the storytelling in it is very patient. These 16 episodes are going to be the, fir- the, you know, the first book in the series of nine books that Diana Gabaldon has written. And uh, they've already renewed for season number two. But 16 episodes is quite a – 16 hours of television is quite a bit uh, of breathing room to tell one story. So uh, just as, a, as an example of how, yeah, the whole entire television landscape has changed. And, and looking at the, the, uh, the Emmy Awards last night is a perfect way to see how – because Breaking Bad is – is was different in so many ways in the way it was presented and the way that they showed it and the, the split season with the, the year apart. That was one of the first shows to do it. Now going to be the standard from, from now on. So, yeah, the, the, the television landscape is definitely changing for the better for those of us who like mature storytelling, right? Yeah, I'm on board with every, every bit you just said. Um, that's <laughs> near the end of our conversation, so I'm going to – try and just put a period or a bullet point on that. Um, and thank you. Um, I hope that we can do this again very soon. I've I always enjoy talking about this stuff with you, and it's kind of fun to do so in a public forum. Um, before we're out of time, though, I just want to say that I noticed today on iTunes, you had a plug, I'm going to throw one in, uh, but the cover of New Order's Temptation that you and I recorded for my album Broken I uh, have. Yes. Is- it's the top-selling Salomon song, not by Salomon Rossi, or based on the children's book Eloise on iTunes. So, <laughs> so nice job. <laughs> Congratulations to us both. <laughs> the the top-selling Salomon song is Mr. Salomon from the children's book Eloise. But, uh, <laughs> well, hey, and since we're talking about it, for the, if there are people listening out there or going to be listening – you should check out the song because it's a beautiful arrangement of a familiar song. So, yeah, check it out. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah, it's available anywhere digital music can be sold or streamed. Um, well, anyhow, it's totally worth, worth a buck. buck. <laughs> it's totally worth a buck. And New Order gets most of it, so it's a good cause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Well, Brian, uh, you know, thanks for for everything you did for me. You're a fantastic man and uh, and for joining me. Like I said, I hope you'll join us. I tried to get OT, our good friend Owen Island, to join us, and I hope that in the future we can we can do that three way soon. Um, yeah, that needs to happen. The world needs to hear Owen. Oh, of course, we both agree on that. <laughs> funniest man alive. It's a shame he doesn't have his own everything. Uh, Amen. <laughs> Well, hey, thank you very much for having me. And I have to say that uh, this was the quickest 30 minutes that's happened to me in quite a long time. Very nice. That's that's, that's great to hear. (laughs) That's great to hear. Hey, uh, that's the show this week, folks. Uh, Tune in next Tuesday. We'll have a special Doctor Who super fan panel uh, with some special guests and surprises in that episode. Until then, I'm Michael Salamone, and uh, be good to yourselves and each other. Thanks. Mm -hmm.